All right. So, uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to this, uh, our Jason and uh, my uh, December session uh, on, I guess, like webinars and training for junior and future lawyers. Today, we have a very special guest. We have Angie Vichayanan. Did I get that right? Yeah, that was good. Okay, <laughs> close enough. I, okay. Um, she, if you guys don't know, she's a huge LinkedIn influencer. Um, IP entrepreneur, IT, um, sorry, IT, IP attorney turned entrepreneur who is now uh, doing multiple things. You're doing um, a company called Leg Up Legal. Uh, you're the CEO, founder, mentor, career coach there as well for prospective and current law students uh, out in Texas. Mm -hmm. You are also a podcast host for the Law Lies Project podcast and also a speaker and most recently a co-author for a book called Hashtag networked, uh, you and 19 other women lawyers basically writing about your successes, trials and tribulations about becoming a lawyer and um, mine is in the mail actually. So Amazon is super <laughs> slow in Singapore, but it's in the mail. Um, <laughs> but today Angie will be, <laughs> and I recommend everyone here to buy a copy obviously because it's an amazing book. Um, but Angie today will be speaking to us about professional communication. Um, how to make a good impression with your boss and your partners, uh, setting expectations with recap emails, follow-up emails, drafting client communications, all very important things to do as a junior lawyer. But many times, actually most often, we're not trained about these things. These are more kind of thrown in the deep end and you kind of figure it out as you go. So very happy to have Angie here with us. Uh, we'll pass it off to you. Sounds great. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Daniel and Jason, for having me today. I'm super excited to be talking to all of you. Um, I know when I started practicing as a young lawyer, there were a million things I wish I would have known before I started. And you show up for work ready to practice on your first day, and your boss gives you your first assignment, and you just stare at them like a deer in the headlights, <laughs> like, what in the world am I supposed to be doing here? And I think that that's really um, nerve wracking for a lot of us because, you know, you think you've gone through all this education, you've gone through law school, you finally arrived, you got that job, and now, now the real work begins <laughs> of really learning how to practice. And that can be really challenging for a lot of folks. So um, I want to talk to you today about some things that might just help ease your transition in. And some of them might seem very common sense. Some of them might seem not so common sense, um, but I think it's always good to come from a very foundational standpoint. No matter what experiences you've had, it's good to just remind yourself and refresh yourself about these very basic skills, as well as, you know, for those of us who, who didn't come into it with all these skills, um, just learning them for the first time to hear it then. So um, I'll give you a little bit of background about me. You know, I'm a first generation Asian American. Um, my parents are from Thailand. They immigrated to the United States, both very late in life. And um, they pursued a master's degree in the United States, both in engineering. So I come from a family of engineers and STEM majors. <laughs> um, and I don't have any lawyers in my family. I had no idea who to turn to. And I was lucky that um, before I decided to go to law school, I took some time time to really understand what being a lawyer was all about. So I took some time to try to contact a lot of lawyers and find myself some mentors in the profession. And one of my key mentors, um, who I still talk to till this very day, was kind enough to take me under his wing and really teach me a lot about how to talk to lawyers, how to communicate with lawyers, how to communicate with everyone in the legal profession, you know, paralegal staff, just how to be really respectful and uh, interact with people from lots of different backgrounds. And that has served me well until this very day. And I think that it's part of the reason why I was able to, you know, acclimate and switch into industries from advertising to law so easily. And then once I was in law school, um, I was shocked and amazed at how very little they taught these types of skills in law school. <laughs> you know, in law school, you, get, you they teach you a lot about the doctrine of law. Why does it exist and why are things this way? Um, but they don't teach you very much about the nuts and bolts of how to interact with people, how to send a calendar invite, how to send a basic email. You know, what do your clients want to see from you? And so I think that all of those skills are going to be really, really important important to you. So um, throughout this presentation, you know, I want to hear from you guys. If there's... Oh, 
I think somebody has their mic on. Hold on. Um, there we go. Um, I want to hear from you guys if you have questions, so feel free to chime in. I'm going to have a presentation up, so it's going to be a little bit hard for me to monitor the chat box, but if you want to just jump on camera and or audio and ask me, then I'm happy to answer you as we go along, or you can save your questions for the end and we can do Q&A at the end. Totally up to you guys. Um, so I'm excited to take them either way. So let's go ahead and dive right in. I'll go ahead and share my screen and we'll get started. So <clears throat> let's see. Okay, um, presentation mode. Okay, perfect. <clears throat> Alrighty, so professional communication for junior and future lawyers. Um, so we're going to go through exactly what Daniel said. We're going to talk about how to make a good first impression, remote work considerations, clarifying questions that you should be asking for each assignment, setting expectations with your bosses and your colleagues using emails, drafting client communication, and writing billing narratives that are gonna make sure your time doesn't get cut because that was the other big thing that I think a lot of us get um, blindsided with is once you start working for a law firm environment, if you're being required to bill hours, um, you don't realize that every hour worked isn't necessarily every hour billed or every hour that you get credit for working. Um, and in some firms, you may not get credit for hours that are cut off of bills. And so you really want to make sure that you're writing effective billing narratives that will communicate what type of work you're doing to your partners and your clients so they don't cut that time from you. <laughs> so um, first, how to make a good first impression. You know, especially in this day and age where we're all working remotely, you really need to take some time to introduce yourself. And that might mean reaching out to your colleagues, not just your supervisor, but also your the other people who are on your team and finding ways to introduce yourself to folks. And maybe your colleagues and your bosses will be good about this. Maybe they won't. I've heard it both ways. Some of the attorneys that I know that started working this year have had really mixed feelings about um, remote work environments and sometimes their bosses really make it an intention to get them engaged in the team and um, assimilated into their team and they find ways for them to have lots of um, communication but sometimes they don't so you might have to really take the extra step and try to get to know some of your colleagues so make sure you have a confident introduction ready. You know, you just came fresh out of law school, so I know it might be a little intimidating when all these people have practice experience, but that's okay. You know, develop your elevator pitch, make sure you're confidently giving it, and don't expect them to necessarily introduce themselves first all the time. Sometimes I'll get onto Zoom calls, and especially with my students or my law students and my young lawyers, um, they'll expect me to go first because they think that I'm the senior person, but they, not everybody is comfortable with that. So you might have to go first, you might have to confidently introduce yourself and wait for them to introduce themselves back. One thing that's really important that you do as a junior associate is demonstrate enthusiasm and curiosity. You have to show them that you're ready to work, you want to be there, <laughs> and that you're very curious about how things work. The worst thing that you can do is to assume how things should run or how things will be. Um, you should always ask if you don't know instead of just saying, okay, well, I assume that I'll be taking an hour lunch break. <laughs> you know, you should find out. Well, you know, is that time really your own or what? what is the norm at your firm? Um, so ask and demonstrate enthusiasm that you're willing to be or willing to work and ready to be there. Then observe and get a lay of the land before you barge right in. <laughs> it's really important, no matter what organization you go to, to really observe others and see the norms. And that's going to be a lot harder in a remote work situation because you're not in an office where you can sort of just lurk and be a fly on the wall. <laughs> so that might mean that you have to create times for you to observe. So that might mean reaching out to your colleagues and saying, hey, would you mind if I sat in on a client? call with you or if I sat in on on you know XYZ a hearing or something so that I could learn more about what I should be doing during those moments. Um, so you might just have to be more intentional about finding ways to observe. And then 
try to figure out what is the pecking order? Who's, who's the person in charge? Who's the person who's second in command? You know, I, I had a partner at one of my very first firms that was really difficult to work with. And we had five partners. Four of them were wonderful to work for. One of them was very difficult to work for. And our, the most junior partner was basically our conduit to the difficult to work for partner. <laughs> she was like the translator of all things that he requested so that we could know what exactly he wanted from us. And so you kind of have to get to know what's the pecking order. If there's somebody who really doesn't like to train people, who can you go to with questions um, that will actually train you? And, and that's another thing that you should be observing. Um, it might not always be clear and it might not always be who your designated supervisor is. Also observe how does work get assigned? You can ask this directly to your supervisors. You know, should I be getting work from one person? Should I be getting work from everybody? You know, how, how do you want me to seek out my work? Um, because it will be different from firm to firm. I've been at firms where you're assigned one partner, one partner only, and they funnel you all your work. And then I've been at firms where the associates, you're responsible for going to seek out your work. If your hours are going to be light for the month, then it's your job to go make sure you hunt down some, some work to make up for those hours. So just really observe those norms and figure out, you know, how, how to get work right away, because that's going to be the thing that drives your destiny. Take notes. The biggest mistake I see young attorneys make and, and law students who summer for us, um, the biggest mistakes that I see them make is they come into your office and you're about to have a client meeting or you're about to have an important meeting with them and they have no pen, no paper, no nothing in their hands. And I'm like, how are you going to remember everything that I'm about to say? You're not going to. And I know that almost instantly that person is going to have a million questions after they walk out of my office. So make sure you're taking notes. You should be walking around the halls. If you're in person right now, you should be walking around the halls with a notepad at all times, pen and paper, all, everywhere you go. Um, because inevitably someone will stop and ask you a question and you're not going to know the answer. You're going to have to write that thing down and go figure out how to get the answer. Um, but there are certain ways to take notes that are more effective than others. So this is something that I learned in my practice. At first, when you start taking notes in a meeting, you're just going to write everything down contemporaneously. Whatever you hear first, you're going to write down and then you're just going to keep doing that for the rest of the meeting. But that's not the most effective way that you should be taking notes. So you should be learning. Um, first, uh, you want to make sure that you organize yourself. So what I would always do is I would literally have a legal pad like this and I would draw two lines exactly like this, one down the middle and then one in the right hand corner. And then I would put all of the notes that I was taking contemporaneously with whatever I was hearing. If my partner was explaining something or if I was listening in on a client call, I would just kind of start jotting down notes um, into the left hand column. And then if there's any action items, those are always going to be important. If the client says, okay, deliver me this by X date, or if you know that there's a deadline to file this brief by this date, all of those are action items. Whenever you hear those things, you write it down separately immediately, you know, in one part of your paper so that it's easy for you at the end of the meeting to just immediately go to the important information. Um, and I would always write down if there's an action item, what the item is, what the deadline is, and who's the person responsible. Because sometimes, surprisingly, there's like this unwritten rule that you are responsible and you don't realize that as the junior attorney. And so, um, that you know, somebody will mention something that's due that week and you're supposed to know that you're going to be the first line to, of defense in drafting whatever that thing is. And you may not, not know that. So um, write down who is the person responsible for it. And if you don't know, that's when you will write down in the corner um, your clarification questions. So if you have any questions, I would include them in the box in the right hand corner um, where I would say, okay, 
you know, you mentioned that this is due on this day, but I didn't know who is responsible for it. And do you want me to work on it? And so you would write down all of your questions in one corner. And this will just help you organize yourself so that after the meeting, when you want, when you want to catch your supervisor or your partner out in the hallway for just a few minutes, or after the meeting, if you want to catch them on a Zoom call real quick, to just go over what happened, um, you'll be able to get to the important information quickly and get, get out all of your questions and keep them organized because your partners are going to be very short for time and they're going to want to just get out of there. So you can't just be flipping through your notes and trying to find all this information. Um, so specifically for remote work, I think there's just some unique things that people should be thinking about. Um, so your first impression may be over Zoom or whatever teleconferencing or uh, video conferencing systems you're using. So you have to make sure you have good lighting, preferably dimmable. Um, I've bought some lighting for these Zoom calls that isn't dimmable and I end up looking like a ghost on them because um, so I've learned <laughs> over time to get the right lighting. Um, so you might want to have, you know, either like a ring light or one of these like dimmable uh, square cubes or even like I actually have these umbrella lights that are actually really easy to use. Um, but it depends on how dark your room is. Um, typically, the room that you see behind me is super dark, but you can see that it's all lit up right now. It's because I have all these umbrella lights around. So you really want to think about how are you looking on camera? Like literally, what is your first impression? Um, is your room really cluttered? <laughs> Just as a practical matter, do you have like a bunch of things in the background that you probably don't want your boss to see? You know, just make sure you have a good clear space. Um, also make sure you have um, crisp audio. So if you have a headset that you need to use, a microphone, um, a lavalier mic, the lavalier mics are the little mics that you see that people pin to their shirts. Um, those are kind of nice because they allow you to be more hands-free as well. Um, so, you know, make sure you have good, crisp, clean audio where people can hear you. Um, Clutter-free space, uh, some easy way to take notes, you know, I mean, even if everything's on the computer, like, especially when you're on a video conference, it might be hard for you to take notes on your computer as you're in the middle of the video conference. So have a pen and paper by you. I know that sounds really, you know, fundamental, but you'd be amazed how many lawyers that I've been talking to that don't do it. So um, just have all those things available to you. Other remote work considerations, again, you are going to have to make extra intentions to bond with your new coworkers. So ask your supervisor if you can have a monthly check-in or mentoring meeting. Sometimes they might volunteer this, sometimes they may not. So ask them, can I have, you know, at least once a month where I get to talk to you about high level stuff about my performance? Um, yeah, they're going to work with you every day where you might get some feedback about assignments, but it really does help to at least once a month take a high level overview of everything to see how well are you actually getting along. You might start to identify some trends in your performance, whether good or bad, that if you catch it on a monthly basis, it can be corrected before the end of the year, um, before things go awry. <laughs> so try to get your monthly check-ins. Invite your attorneys or staff to virtual lunch or virtual coffee. Um, you know, ask them for advice. Listen, the scariest thing about starting as a young attorney is that you're walking into a situation where everyone else has been already working together for quite some time and you're the newbie. So you need to get to know everybody on the team and start to assimilate into the team. And that might mean that you have to, you know, take the extra step to invite people to lunch or coffee and learn about them a little bit. Um, and I know it might seem awkward, but we're in a time when everyone is remote and it's new. So take advantage of the newness to be like, hey, I'm not really sure how to navigate this yet. And this is the only way that I figured it out. So, um, so let's, let's just try it, you know. Um, I think a lot of my young attorneys and law students have been surprised to see that you can actually build good relationships in remote work environments. Um, some of them, you know, have been having very hit or miss experiences with law school and, and with internship assignments, 
But if you really make an intention to say, okay, I'm going to just get over this idea that it's going to be awkward. It doesn't have to be awkward. There's nothing about seeing somebody on video that is inherently awkward. It's just in your mind that you think it's going to be awkward. But if you take some time to say like, okay, I'm going to go into this just curious to get to know this person. I just want to get to know the human being behind the screen. Um, then you're going to find that people are a lot more friendly and warm and inviting, and it doesn't have to be awkward. So just, you know, take some time, invite people to do meetings, um, ask for tips and advice and be curious again, you know, just go into it, use that newness as an excuse to learn things, you know, just, hey, I'm new here. Can you tell me how this works? <laughs> you know, how do people uh, build their time? How do people um, advance? You know, what are some things that you wish you knew when you started? Um, that type of thing. It, it will just help you acclimate a lot faster than if you're trying to just figure it out on your own keep everyone in the loop. So this is gonna be a lot harder when you're not in an office where you can just, you know, scream something down a hallway or just pop into meetings and everyone's there. You know, when you're in a remote work environment, it's gonna be harder to keep everyone in the loop. So it's important that you make sure that you CC everyone on the right emails. Um, pay attention if your partner sends an email to the entire team, and you're responsible for something and you're replying to everybody, make sure you're hitting reply all because you'll be amazed at how many times you think you hit reply all you did not. Um, but also make sure you're only using reply all in appropriate situations. So if they direct a question to you and they say, hey, just touch base with me offline or touch base with me separately, make sure you don't copy the whole group. <laughs> so these are just some faux pas that can happen, you know, if you don't pay attention. So um, Let's see, for every new assignment that they give you, um, there are clarifying questions that just can really save you a lot of time and headaches. <laughs> so first, make sure you know, when should I get that assignment back to you? Um, seems very basic, but you will be surprised how many times the partners forget to mention that or you know, supervisors forget to mention that. I mean, I like to give, think that I give great instructions and great directions and my interns will correct me every time because I teach them to do this. I teach them, you know, ask me all of these questions if I don't clarify them and I'll often find them asking me those questions. So um, make sure that you have a list of clarifying questions on hand because as they're speaking to you, you might not capture everything and or as they're speaking to you, they may forget to mention some stuff. So ask them, when should I get this back to you? What form do you want me to deliver this in? Should it be a memo, email, summary, chart? I mean, sometimes they'll just tell you, oh yeah, uh, give me an answer on this. And you're like, okay, do you want me to send you an email? Did you want like a three page memo? <laughs> Did you want a chart? You know, what is this answer supposed to look like? Um, so make sure you know what form of the assignment should, should you send it to them. Who is the audience? You're always writing for a specific audience. Is the audience ultimately gonna be your supervisor or is it actually supposed to be the client? Because if it's supposed to be the client, maybe you wanna go ahead and draft it as if your supervisor can automatically send it to the client. That would show initiative on your part to understand what is the purpose of this communication. So always ask who's gonna be the ultimate audience. How long do you think this should take me? Or if you're not sure, how long do you want me to work on it before I circle back? This one is so important because as a young lawyer, you're not going to know how long anything takes you. Everything's going to seem like an emergency and everything's going to seem like, oh, it'll only take a couple of minutes or a couple of hours. You have no idea how to gauge how long things will take you. Um, if you're given a research assignment, sure, maybe that research assignment is as quick as looking up one rule and reporting back what that rule says. Sometimes that research assignment is going to mean you're going to pull a bunch of cases and realize there's different cases in every jurisdiction and there's a bunch of minority rules and you're going to have to distill which one applies and and that might take you way longer. So check with your partners, you know, how much time do you want me to budget for this? 
um, so that you can get a sense of, okay, if you have five projects that day, how are you gonna stack your time accordingly so you don't get overwhelmed? And sometimes your partners are just not gonna know. So um, in that case, that's why you should say, how long should I work on this before I circle back? Because if you just leave it at, oh, you know, partner, how long should this take me? And the partner says, I don't know. And you say, okay, and you go off and you burn 16 hours on a research project, almost can guarantee that it's gonna mean bad results. <laughs> so um, you wanna make sure that you ask them, when should I at least circle back with you? You know, Can I circle back with you in a couple of hours and just tell you what I found? And then you can tell me where you want me to take this. Um, that'll save you a lot of headaches. <laughs> um, is there a sample or a form? I'll tell you a quick story. The first time I ever had to draft a complaint for federal court, I made the mistake of trying to draft the entire thing from scratch. And I know to some of you that actually sounds insane. To others of you, you might have actually done the same thing. So um, this is one of those things that to some people seems like common sense and to other people, it doesn't. Um, so I you know, took some time, I pulled the local rules, I looked at other pleadings that were filed in that court and I tried to draft the entire thing from scratch. And my attorney, you know, who supervised me was like, I saw you spent six hours on this complaint. My God, what were you doing? You know, this is a complaint we file every day. You know, the, these types of cases we literally file every day. You only have to change one of the paragraphs and just use the complaint we filed yesterday. Well, I didn't know you filed a complaint yesterday. <laughs> I didn't know that you, you know, have these cases this regularly. And I didn't know that there was a form that I was supposed to be going off of. But if I would have asked, I would have gotten it. So make sure you always ask, is there a sample or a form? Um, if you get an assignment where you really don't know where to start, <laughs> this happens quite frequently in your first year, um, just say, you know, since I haven't worked on this type of assignment before, can you tell me how you would start? And what steps should I be taking to make sure that I, you know, check all the boxes before I deliver this assignment? That way you can see, get into the mind of the experienced attorney, get into their brain and see, you know, what are all the ways that you should go about this? Where would they even start? What, um, what's the authority that you should be looking at? Is there a manual? Is there a rule book? Is there something that you should be searching for? Are there key cases in certain jurisdictions you should be searching for? Um, it'll just save you some time in just running around in circles trying to figure out where to begin. And then finally, is there anyone else that I should loop in on this who has a wealth of knowledge on this topic? Sometimes your attorneys are busy and they totally forget to utilize their other colleagues. <laughs> um, this happens all the time. You know, you might have 15 people that you regularly work with at the firm and then you realize like one person is a whiz in this area of law. And if you could just, you know, mention to them, oh, hey, I gave this associate this particular assignment today. Can you walk him through this? You know, even if your own partner doesn't have time to do it, maybe that person who has all this expertise can. So just ask them that. Is there anyone else that I should loop in? So once you get an assignment delivered, there's also clarifying questions that you should ask to request feedback. Getting feedback sometimes is the most difficult thing to do. If you're supervisors are the types of people that will just redline something and send it to you with just red lines, no comments, no anything, you're not going to learn from just red lines. I promise you that. You need to have somebody who takes the time with you to walk through why did they make these key changes. Um, so if that, or even worse, if they don't even make a red line and they just send it to the client, you never get to see that thing ever again. That happens too. And so you need to be able to request feedback on each assignment. Just ask them, do you have any high level strategy tips for me to improve this assignment? That way they don't feel like, oh, I have to go through this in painstaking detail with this person they're gonna feel like they don't have enough time for that. So just ask them, you know, high level pointers. Did you feel like there were typos? Should I have proofread that? You know, whatever it is. Hopefully you're already proofreading, but you know, just ask them for some high level advice. Then how can I be more helpful? You know, sometimes it's just about, it's not that what you did wasn't good. 
it just wasn't exactly what they wanted. <laughs> and they'll just, if you ask something open-ended this way, then they'll be able to elaborate on how do they actually want things. May I see the final product? So if they do indeed send it off and you never hear back from them, you know that, hey, we were supposed to deliver the client this response in you know yesterday and i'm assuming that that partner sent it out but i never got it he didn't cc me on it okay just ask him you know may i see the final product that was sent do you have an example of a better way to approach this so like the complaint that i did you know they had an example of other things that i should have done instead of what i did but i didn't think to ask for it even after <laughs> um that assignment was finished i actually waited until the next time i got that kind of assignment so you know go ahead and ask that after you send an assignment if if there is a better sample you know look at it at that point setting expectations so setting expectations with your colleagues is one of the most important things that you should do um because everyone's expectations are going to be different and you don't realize it there's always going to be a lot of assumptions about the way things are done and if you think that you know them and you don't actually know them then it can lead to really bad results really quickly so after every meeting that you go to with a partner or a client or anyone go through your notes immediately after the meeting if you can try to fill in any gaps in that moment when it's freshest in your mind don't wait until you've slept don't wait until you've gone to another meeting and you know your mind's somewhere else go through it right after um it happens and then type up a recap email for your supervisor and just say hey thank you so much for inviting me to this meeting um i thought it was really productive or it was really helpful for me to be in that meeting with that client and I wanted to send you my notes in case they were helpful. Um, make sure that you include those action items at the top. So, you know, my understanding is that this assignment is due on this day, we're going to deliver this to this client. Would you like me to work on that? Um, you know, put your, and then after that, put any clarification questions that you had. So if there were things that you didn't understand, maybe they mentioned an acronym that you didn't understand or abbreviation or, or anything, um, put your clarifying questions in there and just say, hey, um, just for my knowledge and better so that I can better understand what's happening in this case, do you mind clarifying some of these things for me? And then put your questions there. And then at the very bottom, just say, and to the extent that any of my other notes were helpful to you, here are my other notes from the meeting. And you would be amazed how many times that your partners will go back and read those things. And they'll be like, oh, wow, there was something that you caught that I forgot to mention, you know, that I forgot to clarify with the client. And that will lead them to go back. But it helps them know that you are actively listening in the meeting. And then it helps them kind of save face when they see things that were mentioned that were incorrect or that they should have elaborated on. And then make sure you follow up the next day if you hear back. I know as a young associate, you don't wanna be bothering people. And it's a fine line between like bothering someone and just, just being diligent. Um, but if you send out something that actually has a deadline associated with it and you don't hear back, make sure you follow up the next day. All right, so client communications. Um, Oh, so basic things that you want. This is going to be a checklist, by the way, of all the things you want to look at. Um, so the first thing is, of course, the subject line. If there's some sort of action that they should be taking, maybe you need to include something like action required or deadline today, deadline tomorrow, whatever it is that lets them know like they need to be doing something and this is when it's due. Make sure you include the case name or the project name and be careful if you're replying back to something on a long chain, it might be time to change that subject line. <laughs> it might be time to say, you know what, we've now gone back and forth on this chain for about 20 emails and now it's changed into something else completely. Change the subject line so it's easy for people to know something's new. Double check the client's name super embarrassing if your client has a name that is spelled a little bit differently like i have a name that's spelled a little bit differently my name is angie with a j and i can't tell you how many emails that i get with angie with a g um so double check the client's name because that's one of the easiest ways that you can just irk the client and you don't want to do that 
keep it short and precise and use white space. Nobody wants to read a giant paragraph of text in an email. Um, so just make sure that you try to keep it short, precise and break it up, break up the information as best as you can. Um, if there's a deadline, bold underline, sometimes highlight depending on how urgent it is, um, but make sure that you call attention to the deadline. No legalese and read it over. Cut out all your excess word and excess words. You know, cut out the prepositional phrases. Cut out anything that you don't think really needs to be there because your client's time is very short and they want to read a short email. Action items at the top. Um, organization is key. Executive summary at the top if it's a long email. If your client is asking for, like sometimes our clients would ask for trademark opinions, right? And the overall underlying question is, is my trademark registrable and can I use it? So we would give them a clearance opinion in an email and it's like about, you know, seven paragraphs long, but the very first thing that we include at the top is, is it registrable? Yes or no. Is it usable? Yes or no? And then we give the opinion. <laughs> so make sure you organize it that way so that the most important information is at the top, the executive summary, and then you go into detail. And then highlight attachments. So I know this is a pain in the butt, but um, this is what I would do. Anytime I was supposed to attach anything as I was writing the email, I would just highlight, you know, attachment. And then as I go back, before I hit send, I would attach the item and then remove the highlight as it's attached so that I make sure that I always have my attachments because the most embarrassing thing is when you send something and your client's like, yeah, there was nothing attached <laughs> and you're like, whoops. <laughs> so you have to go back and then attach it and say, okay, here it is with the attachment. And so you don't want to make those kinds of mistakes. Run it through Grammarly or some sort of grammar um, spell checker or something um, so that it's error free. And then make sure you CC the right people or hit reply all if necessary. And finally, err on the side of caution. When you're a junior associate, most likely nothing is going to go out the door without your partner's eyes on it. <laughs> most likely your supervisor doesn't want you sending anything directly to a client, so um, make sure you run it past the right people. Okay, finally, billing narratives. Um, it's really important that you're as descriptive as possible. Keep your time contemporaneously. I know this is hard. Like, yes, you're going to be tempted to keep time at the end of the day and think, oh, I'm going to remember what I did this morning. But sometimes you'll have 10 matters that you worked on in the same day and you're not going to remember what you worked on in the morning. So keep your time contemporaneously. It's the easiest way to make sure you capture all of it. Time entries are an opportunity to show your boss and your clients what exactly are they paying for. <laughs> so um, make sure that you use them to advocate for yourself. They are a way that you can advocate for yourself. I know that sounds strange, but on these bills, if you're being very detailed about the things that you're doing, it helps your boss to see, oh, they're working hard. Um, they're spending the right amount of time on things, or maybe you're not spending the right amount of time on things and they can catch that and talk to you about it. If you're too vague, it's easier for partners to cut the time. If I see that, you know, a junior associate has spent seven hours writing a memo and they don't give me more detail than drafting memo, then it's easy for me to say, no, they shouldn't have spent seven hours drafting that memo. I'm going to cut that to four hours. <laughs> so, um, you know, you need to make sure that you are descriptive. Maybe you did research while you were doing the memo. In the middle of writing the memo, you realize, oh, hey, I actually don't know this under this key point of law. I'm going to go do research. So then you break it up to say drafting memo on whatever, uh, case law research on this point for memo, you know, and then then I'll understand like, oh, they had to go do three hours of research. I'll save that time. A generic description may actually make your client feel like they're not getting what they paid for. So if the client takes a look at it and it looks like, you know, something like reviewed court opinion <laughs> for four hours. <laughs> they're not going to feel like they're getting what they paid for. Oh, you just reviewed it. It took you four hours to read that opinion, you know, and, and they're not going to want to pay for it. So make sure you're using good descriptions. Proofread your time entries. 
A typo in your time entry just shows that you're being sloppy. I know that time entry is going to be one of those things that it's tedious. Nobody wants to do it. Um, but that's part of your credibility. You know, that's your reputation on the line. So if you, if the partner's get to know you for being that sloppy time entry person, <laughs> that's not gonna bode well for your future career. So here's some examples. Um, about being descriptive and detailed, the word analyze is better than review or consider. So you analyzed that court opinion, you didn't review it. <laughs> um, analyzing shows that you're actually using some level of reasoning. Um, delete your prepositional phrases because they actually lead to passive voice. So instead of prepare summary of transcript for deposition, say summarize Jones deposition transcript. Um, you want to use active voice instead. Don't use abbreviations because your clients aren't going to know what those are. So if you say draft MSJ brief, just say draft motion for summary judgment, you know, something like that. Um, include more details about what was actually discussed during phone calls. Yeah, your client remembers that they had a phone call with you, but they probably don't remember everything that you talked about. So if you had a two hour long phone call with that client, you know, mention, you know, the phone call was with um, this person to discuss their trademark application. We also discussed this other case. We also discussed this other case. You know, maybe that means that you have to separate, separate that out into different line items, or maybe it means that you can capture it all in one flat fee item, but you just have to be more detailed about what, it, what actually occurred during the phone call. Don't forget your preparation time. Um, if you just say, you know, seven hours, participating in hearing on motion to dismiss. I know that's not true. You weren't there for seven hours. <laughs> um, so maybe that meant you prepared your arguments and your exhibits beforehand, and then you went and argued the motion. That I'll pay for, but I'm not gonna pay for somebody who said that they were in a hearing for seven hours on a, on a motion to dismiss. <laughs> that's just too short. So um, break up subparts of large assignments. So for example, you could say, 3.7 hours drafting a motion for summary judgment, but that's going to seem like a long time to me unless it was actually a lot of other things. So maybe two hours reviewing all the testimony and everything that was produced in the case in order to draft your facts section. Maybe it was 1.7 hours of conducting case law research for a specific argument section. You know, break it up and be more detailed that way. So that's basically it. That's all I had for you substantively, but I do want to share all of our resources for you guys. So, oh, wait, let me at least put that slide back up for a second. Um, so yeah, so this is my contact info. If you have any questions, feel free to email me. On my LinkedIn profile, you'll find a bunch of free resources for law students and young lawyers. We have a, actually a resume book that includes resumes for people, and this might not be as applicable for you guys because you're abroad, so um, you might be using a different format for your resumes, but if you're interested in seeing what resumes here in the US look like, you can look at that. Um, we actually host our own meetups every Tuesday and Thursday, so we've done 50 meetups since the beginning of COVID, and we post all of our recordings onto our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash legoplegal. And we go over lots of different um, topics, anything from uh, wellness and mental health strategies, um, professionalism, timekeeping, time management. Um, you know, we've had practitioners come on and talk about their substantive practice areas. What's it like to practice family law or what's it like to practice um, personal injury law? You know, so if you're still in the beginning stages of your career where you're exploring and you wanna be able to hear from more lawyers, go check out our channel. We also have on LinkedIn a number of resources. So we run two post series. One of them is called The Real Lawyers of LinkedIn. Um, that one I feature different lawyers, um, two lawyers a week that you can follow and connect with um, who are in different practice areas. And basically I just started meeting a lot of really cool lawyers like Daniel and Jason on LinkedIn and I wanted other people to discover them too. So the lawyers that are featured in our series specifically want to connect with other people. So don't be afraid to reach out. The Juris Mentor is a post series that I started for just basic tips. So we've had, you know, tips on interview preparation, tips on note taking strategies, you know, basic stuff like that. So um, feel free to follow that series as well. 
And as Daniel mentioned, we also have the networked book um, where 19 other lawyers and me all got together and actually wrote about our experiences at the beginning of COVID-19 and how COVID-19 has impacted our practice and how we all met on LinkedIn. So I think it's actually you know, pretty timely. And if you're interested to see how each of us are handling you know, the changes in our own practice substantively, I mean, most of us practice in different practice areas. Some of us are insurance, oil and gas. Some of us are energy law. You know, I'm in intellectual property. So it might just be helpful to see, you know, what's it like for all these lawyers in all these other areas. So that's everything I've got. And I think we're pretty much almost at time, right? Yeah. Thanks, Angie. Uh, usually we leave some time at the end for some Q&A. So if yeah. anyone has any questions, feel free to drop it in the chat or to unmute and say hi. Uh, Oh, um, I see some questions in the chat. So yes, I will share the slides with Daniel and Jason so that you guys can all have them. Let's see here. Anything else that was in the chat? And y'all feel free to jump on camera too. Don't be shy. <laughs> Anything? So I have a question, Angie. Um, mm -hmm. So when you're talking about getting work from, say, like supervising attorney and whatnot, uh, when what if what happens if you have an issue with the attorney, whether you guys don't mesh properly or you're getting bad instructions or they're showing favoritism? When is it appropriate to go around them to the partner or to someone else? Yeah, that's a good question. I think, you know, first you should try to work it out with that particular attorney. And maybe that's just having a frank conversation to say, hey, the last couple of things I've worked on for you, I feel like it just didn't go as well as you wanted it to go. Um, what can I be doing to improve our working situation? And what are some things that you feel like um, I can do to, to improve, you know, our overall relationship? And if you don't know, um, who are some people that you feel like are doing good work for you and that I can go talk to about, you know, maybe getting some tips from them on how to do better work. Mm, okay. Yeah. So yeah. I think try to work it out with that partner first. If it's really not going well and you really, really can't um, seem to make things work, then I would say, you know, maybe talk to HR and see what's the appropriate way to reach out. If there's another partner that they can get involved or something, they'll help you do that. But, you know, I think that talking to your HR department is good practice just to keep them in the loop. Okay, great. Anyone else have any questions? Well, how many of you guys are young young lawyers and how many of you are law students? Oh no. <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> really dodged the bullet, eh? Um, I guess just while everyone's kind of still thinking over the questions that they've gotten, that was really good, Angie. And I think, you know. <laughs> Um, Daniel and myself having practiced for a few years now um, really learned these lessons the hard way um, so you know from our perspective it's really helpful to actually be able to anticipate these sorts of things especially when coming into practice um, and actually having those little scripts and those little tips of um, you know step by step what to do is just you know um, you, you can't really replicate that unless you go through a year essentially of making those mistakes and um, <laughs> trying to figure it out yourself. Um, so I think, yeah, just from that perspective, it's a massive like confidence. It should be a massive confidence boost um, for the new lawyers coming into the profession. Um, I guess, yeah, it's just, you know, now that, now that we are working more remotely, it's a bit better in Australia than the Americas right now. Um, but, you know, it's, it's still very relevant. We've got, um, we've got a lot of remote work over the next few times. And I think you were right, having that time and having that confidence to just get over that initial anxiety and fear of being like, I don't want to waste people's time. I don't want to look like I'm too, um, I guess, aggressive in following up things and trying to book in these times for people to give me feedback. Um, overcoming that is just super important. So I, I guess that's kind of my overall feel of your presentation. It's been super helpful for me as well. Just What's the percentage of people that are, are remote working, Jason? Yeah, it's a bit different. So we had a couple, we had many law firms kind of 
do full remote work for a few months, but now we've got many of them coming back to full time or, you know, in my case, it's part time um, whenever we want to come in. Um, so, yeah, it's a bit of a mix, but that's partly because we've got like two cases of COVID. Yeah, yeah. And so for all of you um, who are new lawyers, um, did, did you actually get to know all of the people in your office in person the first few months or were you remote? If you're shy, just type in a yes or something in the chat. <laughs> yeah, if, if you're shy, then I'll just check the chat box. Um, I see a couple of people. Oh, and somebody's about to start their JD program too. Okay. It, and are you going in person to your call your university? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Oh, some of you have been in firms for a little while. Okay. Very cool. Um, yeah. I mean, are any of you guys having challenges in, you know, with bonding with new people or anything like that because of the remote experience or was everybody able to fall back into it pretty easily? Did you feel like there was any disruption, Jason or Daniel? Um, so, I mean, I, I've spoken to you guys about this before. I've recently started a new job with UBS and I've only met one person there uh, in person. So it's been a little bit difficult because I think I'm the type that I'm not needy, but I do need attention <laughs> sometimes. So <laughs> when, when my supervisors kind of say, oh, here we go. And I'll speak to you in a month. I'm like, well, that's great. Uh, <laughs> you know, no, no check-in whatsoever. Um, but I, I, I do take your advice on board to set expectations with your direct line manager to say, hey, can we just touch base about my performance and whatnot? Um, and actionables kind of thing going forward in the next six months. That is helpful. And I'm going to implement that for myself, especially because yeah. um, well, my line manager is in Sydney. So I think when you're really junior too, um, it gives you an excuse to say that I'm going to need a little bit more handholding at the beginning. You know, mm -hmm. if you're really junior, you're fresh out of law school. I don't think they're going to bat an eye at you asking for maybe a meeting once every two weeks, <laughs> at yeah. least, you know, to get a face to face, because if they're not doing that for you, you know, you are flying blind that whole time. And that usually doesn't lead to good results. So I think especially for those of you who are really junior, I would definitely make it an intention to get some face time with your um, partners at least, you know, once every other week um, and then or once a month, you know, just to make sure that nothing's gone horribly wrong. <laughs> so. All righty. Any other questions? Lawful quiet out there. <laughs> Maybe it's still early for some in Asia. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, if you guys have any, think of any other questions, feel free to send them my way. You're welcome to email me or um, reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, and I'm happy to send the slides to Jason and Daniel so that they can post those up for you. Yeah, we'll definitely circulate that um, in the email since you signed up to the form. Um, that was really informative, Angie. Thank you very much for that. And I think, you know, Angie, you shared a wealth of ex like resources on that page. Um, it will be available on those slides. I fully suggest people take advantage of that. Um, and otherwise, you know, Daniel and myself, this is the last webinar for the year, but we post regularly on LinkedIn as well, Tips for Young Lawyers. Um, and we look forward to you guys joining next year for future webinars. So yeah, really, really awesome. great to see some attendance, guys. Have a really good holiday. Bye, everybody. All right, thanks, everyone.